Let's look at Ephesians 3. I'll be reading verses 4 through 6. Ephesians 3, 4 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Well, thus far the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for illumination. Great Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would grant us the ability to hear. We have ears. Would you let these ears hear? That you would give us eyes to see and give us hearts to receive this truth. Lord, would you speak to us directly today? Let your Son make himself known. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're probably aware George Burns was a comic genius, but it it has been suggested that his wife, Gracie Allen, was his better comedic half. George was declared the straight man to her antics, but this oversimplifies the comedy duo, right? I mean, since Gracie (laughs) delivered these silly lines with such a straight face. Here's an example. I'll take you home if you give me a kiss. All right, if you take me home, I'll kiss you. Wait a minute. Is your mother at home? Yes, but my father won't let you kiss her. And then George would tilt his head and tip his cigar and look straight at the audience, cementing the joke, including others, connecting them with his marriage. We call this breaking the fourth wall. On a stage or movie set, there's a wall to the left, stage left, there's a wall to the right, stage right, and there's a wall behind. But in front, It can't be a wall or the audience wouldn't see what's going on. So we imagine a divider. Audience members are peering into the world through an invisible fourth wall, like a two-way mirror. The characters aren't supposed to see the audience. They aren't supposed to know that they're being watched. They're supposed to act naturally. That's what makes them actors. But occasionally, actors break the fourth wall and address the audience, looking straight at them, making eye contact, looking straight into the camera. George Burns used this very effectively, including us, the audience, in the joke. I'm told that Deadpool and Wolverine, the superhero movie that just was released last week, breaks the fourth wall to connect with the fanboys. Woody Allen broke the fourth wall in his hit movie, Annie Hall. He explained, because I felt many of the people in the audience had the same feelings and the same problems, I wanted to tell them directly and confront them. Within the genre of letter writing, maybe it's a bit unfair to speak of a fourth wall because the letter writer is intentionally already speaking directly to the audience. I mean, he sent them a letter. That's what a letter is, someone speaking directly to someone else. Still, the letters of the Bible, like Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, are often regarded as formal documents requiring formal protocol. Also, we don't normally interrupt prayers, do we? In chapter 3, Paul is delivering a prayer before God. 
Look at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. The prayer culminates, literally and figuratively, in verses 20 and 21, a doxology, which concludes with an amen. It is a prayer. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. In verses 14 through 19, Paul is revealing to the church his prayer for them, for us. He may grant y'all to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, he says, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and depth and length and height and to know the love of Christ, that y'all may be filled with the fullness of God. This is Paul's prayer for the church for the church in Ephesus, and for the church at large through all the ages. This is his prayer for Reedville. So he closes it with a doxology. In verse 1, Paul began to deliver this prayer for us. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and then he interrupts his prayer. <laughs> he interrupts his own prayer by looking straight at us, at y'all, essentially breaking the fourth wall and confronting you with something astounding, something so shocking that if he didn't address it, you in your natural self-centered bias would ignore unless he called it out, you might have crowded it out of your mind with thoughts only of your personal relationship with Jesus. This is natural, right? I mean, this is natural. People tend to focus on the world through their own little fiefdoms. And like a camera maybe that focuses on the subject at the center of the shot, we don't notice all the other people in the shot in the crisp clarity of our experience, of our family, our situation, our ethnic heritage, our cultural mores and expectations, we miss the bigger picture. If the school system is failing, people tend to focus on their own children's education. We gravitate toward meeting the needs of our family. This is natural. After all, we have personal responsibilities, right, that we must address. And we cannot practically be expected to help everyone. I hear it all the time. My people, your people, we have to protect our own. We have to stick together. It's about family. Again, this is natural. But Paul wants you to recognize who your people are. It isn't skin color or national origin. It isn't caste or class. It isn't have versus have nots. Not management versus line worker. Not industry versus farmers. No, Paul is striving to make it clear that union with Christ creates an unbreakable bond, cannot be broken between believers. Believers of very diverse backgrounds. Ethnic Jews and Gentiles in ancient Ephesus. Locals and transplants in the Carolinas. Paul is repeating himself to some degree because there is such a strong force of opposition to this concept, right? Strong force. 
Society reinforces homogeneity, tribalism, to our shame. It bears repeating because you won't even notice that you're doing it. So Paul looks into the camera, interrupts his time of prayer to confront y'all, us, with this glorious reality. He speaks his mind to you. See Paul looking at you and mean you, y'all, when he writes verse 4. When y'all read this, it says, in the Greek, by the way, these are all plural yous. When y'all read this, y'all can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. He's talking to us. He's talking to you. And he doesn't mean next week. He means now. When y'all re read this, as y'all hear this in Reedville today, do you hear Paul advocating what we call circumspection? See things from a different viewpoint, from a different perspective from your own? Look around. He says, see it from my point of view, Paul, the knucklehead, who tormented Christians, who rejected Gentiles, who promoted his Jewishness. He had been a very proud Pharisee to him and to us. It had been a mystery. It had been hidden. For generations, people had overlooked what God had said to Abram. You will be a blessing to the nations. Nations, by the way, is the literal translation of goyim, the Gentiles. If it was a snake, it would have bit you back in Genesis. The people of God, His covenant community, the nation of Israel, now known as the church, are to bless the nations, to bless the Gentiles, the people different from themselves. Louis reminded us of this yesterday in Matthew 28 during the men's prayer breakfast. I grew up in a Christian home in a Jewish neighborhood, by the way. To my Jewish friends, I was a Gentile. I celebrated Christmas and went to church every other week. Still, I had no idea who Jesus was. I had no idea God intended for his people to bring the good news of the gospel to the nations. I had no idea. It was reality, but even though it had been said probably in my presence... I didn't hear it. And even though it had been said in Genesis 12, maybe no one had looked out at the audience, eyeball to eyeball, and said it directly enough to overcome their self-centeredness. Or maybe it was said, and people didn't hear Paul explains this very issue in verse 5. Look at verse 5. Which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Why hadn't anyone figured it out yet? Because only the Holy Spirit can help you overcome your jingoism, your xenophobia, that's fear of others, your isolationism, your blind patriotism, your ethnocentrism, your sectarianism, your nationalism, your chauvinism, your bigotry, only the Holy Spirit can help you overcome that. Again, I, patriotism has its place. We must recognize the limits of our influence and responsibility, right? I mean, we can only manage what we can manage. 
So we need not always or even often take up arms and eradicate abortion in the United Kingdom, in the UK. We need not always take up arms and defend against Christian bashing in France, nor domestic abuse in Arab countries. Sometimes it makes sense for us to focus on problems in Spartanburg County, in our own homes, our denomination or our congregation. Sometimes patriotism makes sense. Sometimes, of course, we're led to serve as missionaries to people in foreign lands. For the past five years, Debbie and I have been called to serve in the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest regions in America. It's not a foreign country, but it feels that way sometimes. Regardless, as always, we are called to be ambassadors of reconciliation within the spheres of influence in which God places us. Paul is not rejecting looking after national interests, no. Preserve traditions that make good biblical sense, right? Celebrate Thanksgiving with other fellow Americans. Sing our national anthem. Paul doesn't reject these. Rather, he is highlighting that if Jesus is your Lord, you are also a citizen of the most glorious nation in the world, the kingdom of God. You have a king and you have fellow citizens. And if your ethnic heritage keeps you from seeing that, then you need the work of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word to adjust your focus to the United States of the covenant community, the body of Christ. What is the revealed mystery Paul is talking about here? Verse 5, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. To whom is Paul speaking? The church in Ephesus, that's Turkey, and to the church at large. To whom specifically is Paul speaking? To Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians alike. At the margin, let's be fair, at the margin, perhaps he's looking straight into the eyes of the Gentiles. After all, he, they, they had been lied to, right? Some Jews arrogantly suggested that unless they converted to Judaism, they couldn't really be Christians. After all, Jesus was Jewish. But Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, is looking them in the eyes and admitting that this was an error. So in verse 1, he said, on behalf of you Gentiles. You Gentiles are welcome. You are. Come as you are. Yes, repent of your pagan idolatry, but don't buy the line that you aren't welcome. We, the Jews, the religious, the Judaizers, lied to you. We said you must be circumcised. We said that you must be descendants of Abraham. Those were only (laughs) half-truths. like Abraham's claim that his wife was really his sister. It was half true. Jews and Gentiles alike must reject legalism. You aren't saved by circumcision or baptism. You aren't saved by believing in predestination nor by memorizing the Westminster Shorter Catechism. You are saved by Christ alone. Faith in him alone, according to the authority of Scripture alone. By God's grace alone and for his glory alone. 
The Gentiles are fellow heirs. That's the mystery. Not second-class citizens, which is how they'd been treated. If you are ethnically Gentile, stop thinking you aren't good enough. If you avoided church and religion and Christianity in general, set aside your past. If you came to faith late in life after having inflicted pain on others and on yourself, having committed sin upon sin, please don't think that you are inferior. If Christ's blood has cleansed you, you are good enough. If you are ethnically Jewish, stop thinking that others aren't pure enough. If you are Presbyterian, stop thinking that Catholics and Arminians aren't good enough. When Christ's blood cleanses them, washes them clean, he makes them good enough. He exchanges his purity for our sin. Union with Christ is the grounds for God's adopting you. You have an inheritance, therefore. What have you inherited? His promises. Verse 6, you are partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Christ alone, Scripture alone. So rejoice, you are not alone. We are one in Christ, Jew, Gentile, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, white, black, Latino, Asian, Israeli, Palestinian, Russian, Ukrainian. All who trust in Christ alone for salvation from our, are saved by, from our sin and misery. I don't mean every person. I certainly don't mean every Baptist, Methodist, or Presbyterian. Only those who hear and receive, verse 2, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Paul is, has this overarching assumption that you have heard. When I was young, I hadn't heard. I'm guessing people said it. But the Holy Spirit had not given me ears to hear. He'd not transformed my heart. I hadn't heard. So I call you now for you to hear of God's grace. I call. Recognize. Recognize whether you are part of the kingdom. Recognize that people who are very different from you are called to be part of his kingdom. Sure, this was a mystery. Verse 5 de deserves repeating, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Praise God that God's Spirit makes our unity known. Without it, you wouldn't see the breadth and depth of God's redeeming love, it's time to rejoice. If you have union with Christ, if you have union with Christ, and you have union with Christ, then y'all are united together in Christ. God upholds diversity and inclusion, he does. Don't let others co-opt these concepts as if identity politics can bring peace or salvation. All are called to repent and believe. All are called. And this is what I really want you to see. What Paul really wants the church to see. That Jesus, being fully God, broke the fourth wall. By becoming fully man. 
By the Holy Spirit, he was born of a virgin and walked in your shoes. He saw loved ones suffer and die. He spent time with victims of abuse and sinners who felt excluded from the covenant community. And he gave his life to rescue God's elect. He broke the fourth wall from heaven and looks you straight in the eye and says, come. If the Holy Spirit has changed your heart, then you can see. You can see when Jesus speaks to you through the word. This is what Paul means in verse 5. It has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. God graciously grants his elect the ability to see. To see that Jesus has broken the fourth wall. If you recognize him, see that God really does know you. If you know him, see that he really calls you. Like the apostles, like Jesus himself, to break the fourth wall for others. Look them in the eye. Show them that you can relate to their suffering. Tell them that Jesus relates to them. Break the wall and say, come, connect. We are one because he is one. When we are divided, it's not because of our ethnicity or our religious beliefs. That's not what divides us. It's because we won't return Paul's eye contact and perceive his insight. We ignore how Jesus broke the fourth wall for each of us. It's our sin. Don't turn your glance away because of your pride. Instead, receive the mystery of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. He reveals truth by his spirit. Union with Christ means one body. If you do not know him, if you have avoided his eye contact, then now is the time to see him. He relates to you and is speaking to you now. Come and connect. When you read this, as you hear me read this directly to you, see that we are one body. His body. The body of Christ. Ask God to show you unity with those who need his redeeming love, the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. Because of his grace, we are God's people. Invite others, people who aren't even like you, to worship him alongside you. See Jesus speaking directly to you, supernaturally. Speak directly to others, supernaturally, by the Spirit, and watch the mystery unfold. Let's pray. Great Heavenly Father, we thank you. We come before you knowing that you are our Creator. You've just spoken to us, and we've heard these words. We ask, Lord, that you would enliven our lives by your Spirit, that you would allow us to invite others to come and connect, and that we would see our connection to Jesus Christ. Lord, grant us the knowledge of your Son in deeper ways so that others may receive him as well. We pray this in his name. Amen.